Welcome to part three of our three-part video lecture series on shaft whirling and vibration due to shaft whirling. So in part one, we looked at the basic mechanisms behind shaft whirling. In part two, we looked at some practical analysis methods that we can use to determine the first critical speed for shafts, shaft assemblies that have multiple components. And in part three, we're going to take all of this foundational knowledge and apply it to an example from the textbook uh, so that we can see how to actually use this information. So I'm going to attempt to fill in some of the gaps that might exist. I know a lot of students have questions about uh, this example, and I'll try to answer some of those questions along the way. So what are we doing here? We're looking at a simply supported shaft. We have two gears supported by this shaft. We know what the weights are, the masses of the gears. We're told what the geometry is. We have a uniform diameter of the shaft of one inch. We're going to step through the process of using Dunkerley's equation to obtain an estimate for the first critical speed. So the first several steps uh, of this example in the textbook just very carefully steps you through what you need to apply Dunkerley's equation. After that, we're going to demonstrate the superposition approach and see if that produces the same result as the standard approach using Dunkerley's equation. And we hope it does. And then finally, we're going to account for the shaft mass. And so this is something that might not be clear from the beginning in the example. And that is we're going to uh, first only account for the mass of the gears on the first critical frequency. And the gears are much heavier than the shaft, and they're going to have the primary influence on the first critical speed. Uh, but then there is a small effect from the mass of the shaft, and we're going to calculate that and see what it is. So let's have a look at the figure from the textbook to see what the system is that we're looking at. So let's concentrate on this top figure first. So we have a simply supported shaft on either end, so we can't, we're not resisting any moments on either side. And we have one gear seven inches from the left-hand side and another gear 13 inches from that. We're told what the weights of the gear are. The second gear is a little bit larger than the first gear. We have the total length. Also, recall that the shaft diameter is one inch. All right, so what's the first step? Part A, we need to find the influence coefficients. Now, in the previous examples, we were told what the segments in the shaft were, what the locations were that were important for the analysis. In this case, we're not told what the segments are. And so we're going to have to make some kind of assumption and if we're going to look at the effect of these two different gears, we're going to have to have at least two different locations. So let's look at a location at each gear, and we want to find what's the influence of a force at this location one on both location one and location two. And the effect of a force at location two on location two and location one. So how do we calculate that? Well, if this is a simply supported beam, we need to go to the beam formulas. And in this case, uh, it's a simply supported beam and we need to know the effect of a force at an arbitrary location somewhere in the middle of the span on the deflection of the overall beam. So where do we get that? Well, if we go to either equation 724, or we can go to the appendix in the textbook and look up the appropriate beam formula. And using that information, we can calculate what these influence coefficients are. So recall that the influence coefficient delta ij corresponds to the deflection at load i due to a 
unit force at load j. Now, depending on whether we're looking at deflection to the left of the load or to the right of the load, we're going to use two different formulas. The first part of the equation will tell us what the deflection is or the influence coefficient is if the load is to the right of the deflection. And the second part will tell us what happens if the, the deflection is to the right of the load. Okay, so remember from the last video, I pointed out in the ninth edition of the textbook, there is a typo. Uh, this is correct, AJ for each of these cases as opposed to AI. Uh, so where do we use each one of these formulas? Well, let's have a look at the uh, figure here. And say if we want to know what delta one one is, well, so the load and deflection are at the same point, so we're going to use this first formula if we want to know what delta 1, 2 is. Well, then that means the load is at point 2, the deflection is at point 1, and so the deflection met, quantified by x, that is less than the load quantified by a, so that means we're going to use this formula and if it was the uh, reverse of that, if we're looking at the deflection at point 2 due to a load at point 1, then that means the deflection is to the right of the load, and we would use this second case. And you may recall, these should be the same. The compliance matrix is symmetric. So delta 1, 2 is equal to delta 2, 1. Well, what do we need in each of these cases? We need to know what the stiffness is. Here, we're assuming it's going to be steel. We need to know what the area moment of inertia is. And we know from the figure what L is 31 inches. So if we assume a solid circular cross-section, the area moment of inertia is going to be pi times the diameter to the fourth power divided by 64. We plug in one inch and we get 0 0.04909 inches to the fourth power. If we assume this is steel, Young's modulus, it's going to be 30 times 10 to the sixth pascals. And we can see from the figure, the length is 31 inches. So if we combine all of these into this common quantity, 6 times EIL, that's going to be equal to 0 0.2739 times 10 to the ninth. The units are pound inches cubed for that quantity. Okay, so if we take these numbers and the geometry, apply them to these formulas appropriately, we will discover that the influence coefficient 1, 1 is 2.061 times 10 to the minus fourth. And what should the units be? Well, this is the deflection due to a unit load. So if we're using US customary units here, that's going to be inches per pound force. We also need delta to 2. That's going to be 3.534 times 10 to the minus fourth. So that's a larger influence coefficient. So we expect more deflection at 2 due to a unit force applied at location 2 inches per pound force. And we only have one off diagonal term, del delta 1, 2, or equivalently delta 2, 1. And that's 2.2 two, two, four times 10 to the minus fourth. Now remember, this is due only to the mass of the gears. 
Right now we are ignoring the mass of the shaft. So what do we need next? Uh, we need to determine the deflection of the shaft at these two locations due to the gear weights. So we want to calculate what Y1 is and Y2 is. So Y1, that's going to be the summation of the deflection due to gear 1 and the deflection due to gear 2. If we are assuming small deflections, the model is linear, so we can use superposition and simply sum these deflections. So Y1 is going to be equal to W1, so that's W, not omega, times delta 1, 1, plus W2 times delta 1, 2. And recall W1 uh, from the figure, that is 35 pounds, and W2 is heavier, that is 55 pounds, and we have the influence coefficients right up here. Plug those in, and the deflection is 0 0.01945. Okay, we need the deflection at location 2, and that's going to be W1 delta 2, 1 plus W2 delta 2, 2. That's going to be 0 0.02722 inches. Okay, that completes part A. And then part B, we look at the next step working toward using Dunker Lee's equation. This next step requires us to find these two quantities. Um, and also, we're asked to find what is the first critical speed using Rayleigh's equation. Uh, and then we can compare that to what we get with Dunkerley's equation. So this first quantity, if we plug in all the values that we calculated in part A, we find that is equal to 2.178, and the units are going to be pound force inches. And then here we just square the deflections, and if we plug in all the quantities, we get 0 0.05399 pound force inches. And using Rayleigh's method, our estimate for the first critical speed is going to be 386.1 times 2.178 from right there, divided by 0 0.5399 from there, and the square root of that. And that's equal to 124.8 radians per second. Now, if we remember, uh, this is a, a very approximate method, and it tends to overestimate the first critical speed. And that implies that we need to use a larger safety factor to be safe in this case. Uh, Dunkerley's method, on the other hand, it tends to underestimate the first critical speed. So it's a bit more conservative than this. And again, keep in mind that this ignores the mass of the shaft. OK, part C. We are asked to find omega 1, 1 and omega 2, 2. These are needed for applying Dunkerley's equation. And recall what these quantities mean. Omega 1, 1 
is what the first critical speed would be if mass one was acting alone, but still considering the geometry and elastic properties of the overall system. Uh, similarly, omega-2-2, two, two, that would be the first critical speed if mass two was acting alone. A formula we went through previously, we derived in part two, uh, helps us to calculate what omega-1-1 one, one and omega-1-2 one, are. Here we need to solve this equation for omega-1-1. One, one. Now this is in terms of known quantities, the gravitational constant, the weight of gear one, and delta-1-1. One, one. Let's see, delta 1, 1 up here is 2.061 times 10 to the minus fourth. This is an intermediate quantity we need. That tells us the first critical speed due only to gear one. If we were to go through all of the same calculations, but this time for the first critical speed due only to gear two, we would discover that is smaller at 140.9 radians per second. So just thinking in general about uh, dynamics of systems like this, this is expected because gear two is heavier than gear one. So we would expect that the natural frequency would be lower in this case. Or sorry, not the natural frequency, the first critical speed. Okay, so part D, we're putting all of this together. We want to find what is the first critical speed using Dunker-Lee's equation. And recall that is this, one over omega one squared is equal to the summation from, in this case, I equals one to two over one over omega ii squared. Now, remember where we got this from when we derived it last time. Um, this is an approximation. Uh, more precisely, the left-hand side should be a summation, but we are assuming that one over omega one squared is uh, going to be much larger than one over omega two squared and so on. Uh, here we only have uh, two, but for this equation, we're assuming all of the higher order terms go to zero. So this is an approximation and the typical result of this approximation is that it uh, underestimates the first critical speed, and so it's more conservative. Okay, so if we were to take the values we calculated up here, square them, invert them, sum them, we would get this quantity, 6.905 times 10 to the fifth, and then solving for the first critical speed we get 120.3 radians per second. So that is the answer to part D. Now, the next step asks us in part E to find the same quantity, the first critical speed, but this time using superposition. So if you recall, uh, the basic strategy is uh, recognizing that we can find an equivalent load that would produce the same deflection at a given location due to uh, a force at some other location. And, and we can choose a convenient location for analysis. So in this case, we're gonna choose the center of the shaft and find what is the equivalent load due to the masses due to the weights of the gear at the center. Uh, so that's what's illustrated in figure B. We wanna figure out what are these 
equivalent loads. Uh, the numerical solution is given right here in the figure. And so we're going to find out how do we get those values. OK, using the influence coefficient formula, we can calculate what delta CC is. Uh, so this is the deflection at the center due to a load at the center. And that's going to be equal to B CC XCC times L squared minus BCC squared minus XCC squared all over 6EIL. We've already calculated this quantity. And the center of the shaft, uh, if L is equal to 31 inches, then the center is going to be half of that. So we plug in all of the numbers from the geometry. And we get 4.215 times 10 to the minus fourth. Remember the units. Deflection from a unit load. So in our unit system, that's going to be inches per pound force. Now, this is quite a bit larger than the previous influence coefficients that we calculated. And so it's good to think conceptually, is that expected? So these previous influence coefficients, the, the largest one was 3.5, but here we're at 4.2. And if we look at the figure again, the other locations we were looking at are closer to the ends here. And so we would expect there would be less compliance uh, at these locations. And for a simply supported beam, the most compliant location is going to be right in the center. OK, what other quantities do we need to estimate the first critical speed? Let's look at the formula that we derived last time. First critical speed is going to be equal to the square root of the gravitational constant divided by delta cc times the summation of wic. Recall, these are the equivalent loads for each of the loads in the system uh, if they were uh, directed at the center. Uh, so if we had a, uh, an equivalent load at the center, uh, that would produce exactly the same deflection at each of the locations of interest. Uh, those are the quantities that we're after. So how do we get that? So the general formula, W, the weight, I, C. So the equivalent load at the center producing a deflection at location i is going to be equal to the load at location i times the influence coefficient delta ii over delta cc. So we, in both cases, know what WI is, we know what delta C e, CC is, and we need to know what delta II is, and we have those calculated previously. So we need two quantities. We need W11, and that's going to be equal to 17.11 uh, pound force, and we need Let's see, uh, sorry, not W11, that's uh, W1C. And we need W2C. And that's going to be equal to 46.11 pound force. Uh, so this is substantially higher. Again, we can see that the effect of gear 2 is much larger than the effect of gear 1. So now we have these quantities. We plug those into the summation. We take delta CC, plug it in right there, and we obtain omega 1 is equal to 
radians per second. That is the answer to part E. If we compare that to the answer from part D, uh, at least within rounding error, it's the identical answer. Now, part F asks us to account for the shaft. And really just looking at the end of what we're trying to do, um, we want to incorporate the effect of the shaft using Dunkerley's equation. So recall that Dunkerley's equation 1 over omega 1 squared is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of each of the n masses over 1 over omega i i squared. Now, previously, we used n equals 2. We had two gears. Well, to account for the mass, we simply need to say that n equals 3. So we have the first two, again, the effect of the individual gears on the first critical frequency. And now we just need to add the effect of the shaft on the first critical frequency. So what would be the easiest way to figure this out? Well, we have a simply supported uniform diameter shaft. And one of the first formulas that we went through in part two of this video series was the exact solution based on the associated partial differential equation uh, that gives us the first critical speed uh, for a shaft that's simply supported uniform diameter with no components on it. So just the shaft alone, uh, the formula we need is this. I'm going to call it omega 3, 3, or omega shaft. And that's going to be equal to pi over the length of the shaft squared times the square root of the gravitational constant times e i over the cross-sectional area times the density. So what are all of these component values? Uh, the density, that's going to be equal to, for steel, uh, 0 0.282 pound force per inch cubed volume. Uh, so notice this is the weight density that we're dealing with here. We need to know what the cross-sectional area is. That's going to be pi d squared over 4 or 0 0.7854 square inches. Now, if we were to plug everything into this equation, we'd find omega 3, 3. That's going to be equal to pi over 31 squared times the square root of 386.1, the gravitational constant, times Young's modulus, 30 times 10 to the 6th, times 0 0.04909 that we had calculated previously for the area moment of inertia, and divided by the area, 0 0.7854 square inches, times the density, 0 0.282. We calculate that and we obtain 520.4 radians per second. So one of the main things to observe here is this is substantially higher than the natural, sorry, the first critical speed due to each of the gears alone, and also substantially higher than our uh, overall first critical speed for the system. Uh, so what we can take away from this is we would expect the 
influence of the shaft mass to have relatively small influence on the first critical speed. It does add mass to the system, so I would expect it to reduce the first critical speed some, but not by a lot. So if we were to go back to this formula and include all the quantities, uh, including what we previously calculated for omega-1-1 and omega-2-2, and now omega-3-3, and solve for omega-1, we obtain 117.3 radians per second. So this is the answer, including the effect of both gears and the mass of the shaft. And as expected, this is a little bit smaller than what we calculated as the first critical speed due only to the shaft. So either using superposition uh, or using Dunker-Lee's equation uh, without superposition. All right, that concludes this example. I hope this was helpful, and this concludes the third video. Thank you.